Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. Recently, a prominent psychiatric journal published an article definitively disputing the narrative that depression is caused by a serotonin chemical imbalance in the brain. This hypothesis has been promoted for almost six decades now, which has resulted in an ever-increasing use of antidepressant medications and subsequent big pharma profits. Let's talk with the person responsible for this groundbreaking study, that seems to have touched a nerve about how we should best embrace those needing mental health support. Well, uh, warm greetings, everybody. We are excited about our podcast today uh, with uh, a very special guest, uh, Dr. Joanna Moncrief, who's a psychiatrist and researcher in academia, academic in uh, England. And uh, you teach at the uh, College and University College in London, is that correct? That's right, yeah. And um, you are a, quite an interesting person because you're getting an awful lot of press on the, on the web from an article that you wrote. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll kind of go through the sequence of how, we, how you came to our podcast because I think that's, uh, that'll set the stage and then we'll let you, let you start talking. That, um, Greg sent me a very interesting article where you were referenced in an article in, in Counterpunch magazine, and I'll link this in our website. It was just an overview of um, a review of your article, The Political Economy of Mental Health, a Marxist Analysis. And we'll dive deeper into that, but it 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 also referenced your very uh, interesting article that was just a month ago in Molecular Psychology, The Serotonin Theory of Depression, A Systematic Umbrella Review of the Evidence. And um, that article has created quite a buzz on the, on the web and other, you've been getting some interesting press. Uh, and um, so let's just, maybe talk a little bit about your background and um, and welcome to the show. Tell, tell us about yourself. Thank you. So yeah, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. So I, I did a medical degree and then I went into psychiatry training and I've always worked uh, clinically as a psychiatrist in the National Health Service in England. And then at some point during my training, I started to get interest interested in research and, and academic work and I did various research jobs and, and then got a university position uh, doing uh, research on psychiatry but I also but, but, but alongside that I continued to do some clinical work and my main areas of interest have always been the uh, use of drug treatment of, of prescription drugs to treat mental health problems uh, but I'm also interested more widely in the philosophy, politics and history of psychiatry and of mental health problems. And just to add to that, because I, I remember this when I was thinking recently about all the um, pushback I've had on the serotonin article, uh, I, I, um, I, I worked as a junior researcher on a couple of drug trials. So I got it. I, and, and I'm actually running a randomized controlled trial at the moment. Um, so, so I have a, a bit of insight into, uh, into the pharmaceutical industry and, and drug trials are done. Right. And, and your article is, I, I, I first learned about some of the problems with this years ago, reading um, Whitaker's book, uh, The Anatomy of an Epidemic. And now he's been, you know, talking more about that. But the, the gist of your article, which no one has questioned your research methods, in fact, they praise them, how extensive your meta-analysis was, is that you just went through all of the available uh, history of the narrative that uh, people who are depressed have a chemical imbalance in the brain and serotonin seems to be the one of the things that uh, is responsible for that. 
and that this class of drugs either uh, inhibits the uptake of serotonin, which creates more serotonin in the brain, and that and that is um, why you have a good response to a somewhat good response to uh, depression because it's dealing with the chemical imbalance. And the dirty little secret is that a lot of people have known that probably is suspect for a long period of time, but it was somehow your article a month ago that just exploded on the web. I mean, you, 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 you have Rolling Stone had an article about you. The Guardian had an article about you. <laughs> you know, Tucker Carlson had a person on talking about your article i would just go on and on and so talk, talk about that about about mm -hmm. the yeah. you know, so, how did we how did how did this get so so yeah. big so fast so so, so maybe I'll, I'll explain why we did this research so like you say it has been rumored for a long time that actually the serotonin theory of depression was not supported by evidence and that the research on serotonin and depression was inconsistent and really didn't demonstrate any uh, any consistent links. Um, but, but there's never been a, a sort of proper systematic overview of all the different strands of research. Uh, and one of the reasons there, has, there hasn't been anything like that before is there are just so many different types of research that have been done to try and work out whether there is an abnormality in the serotonin system in people with depression. And one of the reasons there are so many different types of research is because you can't measure serotonin in the brain directly. So people have used lots of other ways, done research into, in lots of other ways of looking at what serotonin might be doing, uh, such as looking at uh, serotonin levels in the blood, uh, serotonin, the levels of the serotonin breakdown products in the brain fluid. And serotonin receptors and genes, etc. So, so we got all all that evidence together, um, and, and and that's what it, it, that enabled us to you know take an overview and to be able to say definitively, you know there is there is no good supporting evidence for this theory because before we'd done that, you could have said well there's no evidence of you know, effect uh, on serotonin receptors, but then someone might say, oh, but there are these studies looking at this, you know, what about them? So, so it was important to get all this research together in one place in order to, in order to come to a conclusion. And it was also important because, like you say, this idea has really embedded itself in public consciousness. And I was, uh, I, I was reflecting earlier that I think, I think, um, probably more so in, in, in the United States than in Europe, actually. But, but in Europe, it's fairly well embedded too. Um, this, so, 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 so the majority of the public believe that depression has been linked with low serotonin and, and that that is an established scientific fact. And they believe that because the pharmaceutical industry uh, launched huge marketing campaigns back in the 1990s when they were trying to market the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRI drugs. And those marketing campaigns really played on this, um, uh, re re put, put out this idea that depression was a chemical imbalance. There was a very good reason for that. Um, the, uh, in the 1980s, the big, the, the big sellers for mental health problems were benzodiazepines like Valium and Librium. And at the end of the 1980s, there was a huge scandal because it became apparent that those drugs were highly addictive and could cause very unpleasant withdrawal symptoms and were being doled out willy nilly to all sorts of people who had unhappy and difficult lives, um, particularly women. And so the idea of giving a drug to tranquilize you or numb your numb your feelings really came into serious disrepute in the 1980s and so the pharmaceutical industry had to find a new narrative to sell their next generation of pharmaceuticals for mental health problems and the new narrative was you've got an underlying imbalance an underlying abnormality and the drug is going to put it right which of course makes taking a drug sound very appealing sound benign 
uh, and, and logically the right thing to do. Whereas if you're selling, you know, if you were selling a, a tranquilizer or some sort of numbing agent in the 1990s following the benzodiazepine scandal, you wouldn't have had such a big market. And, and the pharmaceutical industry has had a pattern of um, deception and mendacity associated with this and, and continues to have that pattern. For example, it, you know, obviously the Oxycontin problem, which was sold and marketed as, you know, can't we just get rid of pain? It's not addictive. It's not. And, and we knew that, that finally that's sort of blown up and, and, and had been exposed as a, as a, as a horrible uh, event that occurred in, in, in medicine. Uh, he, but even recently, uh, the psychiatrist that was paid a million and a half dollars by uh, Johnson and Johnson to try to get into the DSM, the category of uh, juvenile uh, bipolar disorder, because, oh, I have a pill that will treat juvenile bi bipolar disorder. So if you go back and look at the narratives, I listened to a podcast on you two days ago. I don't know if you were on uh, On Point, which is a WBUR national public radio. They were playing the old, the old TV advertisements. They're just, they're just hor they're horrible, you know, because they're not accurate. But it's, it's like, well, we have a pill for that. We, we you know, don't be gloomy. Get rid of, have the little bluebird come on your shoulder rather than this cloud of depression. One of the reasons I think the chemical imbalance myth took off so much is it's such a nice, simple narrative. Uh, and the pharmaceutical industry, you know, presented it in this lovely, appealing, simple way. Right. And uh, made a lot of money about it. And made a lot of money. Just a historical question. Uh, uh, when, you know, when I was an undergraduate, uh, you know, people still talked about in my psychology classes about therapy and, and uh, the various, I mean, Carl Rogers, I remember reading about Carl Rogers, they were very much impressed because the idea of success was uh, the matter of recidivism. You, you know, you're done, you've solved these, these emotional problems and you move on. Uh, but when did, the, when did the chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry and the, this notion of chemical imbalances take over from the old therapeutic model? I mean, when, when and how did that happen? So, so um, a couple of things to say on that. The, obviously psychotherapy became enormously popular particularly in America less so in Europe in the middle part of the 20th century and it was really in the 1980s that it starts to that that that, um, uh, that, that therapeutic approach starts to uh, be criticized and to be replaced and there are a number of factors um, it's perceived to have overextended itself. Um, so, you know, psychotherapists are starting to sort of suggest that everyone needs psychotherapy, everyone's mentally ill. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, it's very expensive, particularly in the US where therapists all have to be medical at this, at this point. So, <clears throat> so um, and, and also there, there are, the, there's the anti-psychiatry movement, which has happened, happened in the 60s and 70s, and the Rosenham experiment. There are lots of things that are criticized, lots of um, influences that are criticizing psychiatry. And although they're criticizing biological psychiatry, I think psychiatry as a whole sort of feels vulnerable. And the way it deals with that vulnerability is to become more biological. And that is symbolized by the introduction of the DSM-3 in 1980 and revised versions over the 1980s and, and by a turn towards pharmaceutical treatment and, and a turn away from therapeutic, from therapy as, as the main form of treatment. And I, I'd like to shift a little bit here. Um... And, and see if I can get you to, to talk a bit about this. Gre Greg sent me this cartoon. I don't know if you can quite see it, but the, it's a, a Simpsons cartoon. Uh, could an exploitive, oppressive, mind-numbing society cause people to feel depressed? And then the second uh, panel is, no, it's the individual chemistry for no reasons. It's the individual's chemistry for no reason. So we have a society that neoliberalism has run amok on our society. 
with increase in uh, yeah, you know, wage stagnation, more women going to work because they have to, uh, discrepancy between wealth. Uh, I, I, you, there, there's a very good website, WTF 1971, that is a series of charts just showing you how the Reagan-Thatcher neoliberalism has created a brush fire of distress in our society. And then we have COVID hit, and all of the problems associated with that. Uh, the uh, four in 10 adults report symptoms of anxiety and depression now, as opposed to one in 10 uh, prior to the, the uh, COVID uh, lockdowns. This is from John Oliver, by the way, which also had a segment specifically related to the themes associated with our podcast today. The number of psychiatrists and psychologists that are not seeing patients, 65% of psychologists don't have the capacity to see new patients. The number of psychiatrists that are uh, not seeing patients is increasingly getting smaller. And yet, I think it was in your article, you said, is it one out of four people in England are on some sort of psychotropic depression or anxiety drug? One out of four people in England are taking either uh, either an opiate, an opioid, or a antidepressant or benzodiazepine. Okay, yeah. so we have that, and and then we have. I'm sorry, and, and to add to that, one one out of six people, seventeen percent, are taking an antidepressant. All right, so it gets worse. In our country, you can't get juvenile um, care. Uh, when we had Dr. Bonigan on, a pediatrician, he was talking about how he used to be able to just call a psychiatrist and get people right in. And uh, that was when I was a school psychologist, I had a list of three or four psychiatrists that if I had a really difficult case, they were, they were seen immediately. Now we have the emergency room being the filtering factor. And we have shortages of mental health counselors. Um, so it is quite a hot mess. Yeah. Then and, and, you... and the other thing that's happened recently, certainly in the UK, and I expect in the US as well, is that psychiatrists now have a much more circumscribed and narrow role. So, I mean, I mean when I was training, psychiatry was you know, not just about biological psychiatry, but was also about doing therapy and thinking about people's social situation as well. But now more and more, the psychiatrist is the team member who simply prescribes uh, and, and that's all you do. And, and so a, a big focus of treatment is, is prescribing drugs, but bigger than it was. Well, in the States, there's a, there's a terrific class dimension to this because not only are people treated at a higher end with drugs for, for depression, but at the lower end, they're put in jail. I mean, essentially the United States has the largest number per capita of people incarcerated than any other country. And for the most part, that's one answer to mental health is mm -hmm. to put people in jail. It's uh, tragic, but it, it, it illustrates the disconnect between the problem and a modern capitalist solution, just as drugs is a disconnect between the problem and, and a solution to, to depression over the kind of life that uh, people live. The okay. emptiness and shallowness or the, uh, the rawness and vulgarity of the life people live. Right. Uh, absolutely, I mean, the, the rocketing, it, the graphs of the prison population in the US, but it, it, actually the same trend has been happening in the UK since the 1970s are just so shocking. And you know, if you need any more evidence that something's gone wrong in society, I, I don't know what that could be. You know, it's just there in front of, in, in front of your eyes, this, you know, this escalating prison population, which is the result in, in, in my view of increasing inequality the, uh, and the increasing insecurity of so many people's lives. And, so and people then, have fewer and fewer options, you know, particularly working class people have fewer options right. um, nowadays for, you know, for decent, secure employment that will earn them enough to, you know, to, to have a decent living and keep a roof over their heads. So I, 
we, we need to insert a little uh, a disclaimer in here. Your articles and everything I've read about you is very ethical. Of you're not just telling people, "Oh, quit taking your medications." You know, you you know, you, you are you're you're not against medications in, in for uh, certain populations. Obviously, you're against this idea that they are being dispensed so freely with such great. Um, uh, they've been escal escalated in their use at the expense of what is good mental health treatment for these problems, of which some of them, from a Marxist perspective, are contained within our society and the alienation and the economy and the destruction of families and all of these other things. And yet we then ha have a pill for that. We have a pill for that. It so, yeah, so my... My work has my work on drug treatment has been about how we misunderstand what they do, and this relates to relates to our understanding of mental health problems in general, because the mainstream view about psychiatric drugs, and this is why the serotonin paper caused such a stir. The mainstream view is what they are doing is working by targeting an underlying biological abnormality that is the cause of the symptoms or the mental disorder. And what I've been saying for many years is that we have no evidence that any class of psychiatric drug works in that way because we don't know the biological mechanism behind any mental disorder. But we do know that the drugs that we give, that, that we use, that we prescribe, change normal mental states and, and feelings and behaviors. Uh, you know, some of them are tranquilizing in one way or another. We use the stimulant drugs for ADHD. Um, and my view is that sometimes those drug-induced alterations to normal functioning can be useful. But it's very important that we understand what they are, because if we allow ourselves to think that the drugs are somehow rectifying an underlying abnormality, that means that we don't make sensible or cautious enough decisions about using the drugs. And it also means that we, that we don't recognize that what we are treating are the emotional and behavioral consequences of the society that we live in. And I let, let, let me ask a question, uh, Pat. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, yeah, it looks as though uh, some people uh, would prefer to narcotize or imprison people who have issues or mental issues, depression, what have you. What would constitute a program? I'll be the devil's advocate. What, what would constitute a good program for uh, dealing with this? And how would you measure success? Uh, philosophically now, how, how, how would you, you've, you have a lot of experience, how would that better be conducted? So, uh, I, I mean, I think with common mental health problems like anxiety and depression, the, the, what we need to do is we need to deal with the, the reasons why people become anxious and depressed. So we need to create a society in which people have more secure employment and housing and incomes and things like that. Uh, and, and, and that is overriding the, the main thing that we need to do. We need to, um, we need to reduce the emphasis on competition, which makes everyone very stressed and makes everyone feel you know, that they're failing all the time. Uh, we need to create more opportunities for social mixing so that loneliness and isolation are not such big problems. So, so I think the answers for anxiety and depression are, are really about changing our society. And um, at, at, until we do that, we, we're just offering people sticking plasters or just trying to help people troubleshoot, you know, or sort out their own individual situations. Um, the, uh, and and, and, and when, I, when, I, um, when I worked in a deprived area of London, taking referrals from general practitioners, a couple of years ago, it really was like dealing with a tidal wave of, of misery that was all related to people's financial insecurities, housing insecurities, drugs and crime in the area, uh, etc. 
Um, when, we, when we're talking about more serious mental health problems, such as those that we might, that someone that might be diagnosed as schizophrenia or psychosis, then I think it's, it's slightly different. I think that, you know, if you look back through history, these sorts of problems have always occurred and probably always will occur to some extent, although they are, although I should say that they are also um, often related to, uh, you know, to adverse events, childhood trauma and things like that, but, but not always. Uh, and so, so with those sorts of situations, I think we do, I think drug treatment can be helpful sometimes. I think antipsychotic drugs do help to dampen down psychotic symptoms like hallucinations and delusions. But I also think that we need to find a way to help people to integrate. Uh, and and, and that's, that's quite economically complicated at the moment in the UK, and I expect it's the same in the US, you know, we have this benefits trap whereby you really have to be in quite well paid employment to make it worthwhile coming off your sickness benefits. And so a lot of people with serious mental health problems are on sickness benefits and never get the, the chance of, of uh, going into employment. Um, and so I, I, I personally have thought that solutions like universal income might be a good idea. Uh, and, and might you know that would that would do away with the whole need for sickness benefits and hopefully then enable people to take on some work on top of uh, on, on top of their their um, income from the state and thereby enable them to contribute to society in some way because maybe not everyone but most people even if they have got severe mental health problems can contribute in some way and want to right right and that was Whitaker's book, I, it must be 10 years old now, that it was talking about those who end up getting on medication early in their teens. And, you know, you initially have a positive effect from it, but then it, that d diminishes. And, and that if you are put on SSI, which is, you know, the, uh, because of a, a, a emotional or mental issue, you never get off. No, you're, the, people don't leave that. So, uh, yeah, it, it confirms the sick role, doesn't it? I think that, you know, right, um, right. And this, this worries me that, you know, that people with mental health problems end up in a long term sick role because we just, we just haven't, haven't thought of other ways to, to help and support people that, 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 that don't revolve around saying you've got a sickness, you've got an illness, a chronic illness, which of course is a very, debilitating message to, uh, to, to, to receive and, and, you know, and often people come, you know, do, do then sort of a, a you, you know, it's very well. <laughs> do right. then sort of slip into that role. When you, when you look at the advertising in the United States, I'm sure it's true in the UK, but in, in the States, uh, the advertising for, for uh, antidepressants on television is only rivaled by the attempt to destroy social security, which is the other big advertising thing. But I mean, it's, go it's really difficult. It's going to be really difficult to win people to uh, questioning this kind of approach. This, because you see a commercial where someone is just so happy and content and they've been released, they've been liberated from this, this problem and they're dancing down the street and a million dollar commercial is showing you just what can be accomplished. And now there are drugs, there are drugs on top of the drugs that supposedly take the edge off of whatever symptoms the drugs may produce. So, I mean, the battle to, to win a sane approach to mental illness is, is really one that's fraught with great, great difficulty. It's gonna be very difficult to, to win. It's, it's very difficult and, and the social changes that we need to improve people's lives and stop them getting depressed and anxious are, are you know, are going to be difficult to win too. Right. Obviously, that's a, you know, a, a political, a political yes. project. <laughs> you know, I, get, getting back to this capitalism I issue, look, on July, um, first week of July, we had our wonderful fellow, Stephen Gowans, who's a a Canadian that is a prolific writer. And he wrote a book called The Killer's Henchman, 
which is how it's about capitalism and the COVID disaster, the how a lot of our decisions made of how we treat COVID, the fact that the trials went so quickly, uh, that these were not necessarily made because of good, sound scientific reasons. They were made because of the uh, financial benefits that flowed and how capitalism was kind of interfering with the um, treatment of the, uh, of, of the pan pandemic. And he laid out his, uh, his point very well. And it, that brings me to the topic of these online therapies. And I, and I, and I have a disclaimer. I, I was in private practice with a fellow who's a social worker, uh, MSW, and he's one of the best therapists I know. He lives in a rural part of Eastern Washington and he is approximately my age, and he's, he's, he works 40 hours a week in online Zoom and text with one of these companies, a Better Health, Talkspace, Cerebral, they're all of these. And the, uh, all they do is require that the therapist uh, be certified and current and have insurance, but they don't monitor the care at all. It's, it's like an Uber. It's, it's, it's a fast food restaurant. And for some people in rural areas, uh, and again, John uh, Oliver in his most recent segment last Sunday was talking about the problem of people in rural areas getting treated. And, you know, they, he, they, they say, you know, you just need to suck it up, buttercup. You know, if, if in certain areas, this would probably be a viable, good thing to happen. But I get the feeling it's just a way of making money. And especially with people like uh, Cerebral, which is now dispensing medication in almost nine out of 10 of all of their interactions online, gotcha. it, becomes gotcha. a, it becomes a pill factory. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it is, as a psychiatrist who, who does counseling and is trained, and, and uh, this just must just send you over the top. I, I don't know. What are your thoughts about these new... So, um... I don't know so much about the online therapy world, but I know that there are um, there are companies in Europe and the UK that are um, th that provide online assessment, psychiatric assessments, diagnostic assessments, particularly for uh, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, and, and autism. And there's just so many things wrong with that, in my view. You know, it's just it, it's a tick box approach, as if you know, as if you were, oh, as if you were diagnosing a very simple medical condition, but actually, you know, it's difficult to diagnose even a, even a simple medical condition online with a tick box, uh, you know, a tick box approach. Um, but, uh, but clearly, if you're, you know, if you're trying to, I mean, the whole concept of diagnosis is flawed in the first place, you know, what is diagnosis, it's, it's an attempt to put a label on what are always very complicated problems. And the idea that you can do that in an online interview with a, you know, following a questionnaire and ticking, asking these questions and ticking boxes is, is to my mind is absurd. Uh, and uh, in the case of ADHD, particularly seems to be a gateway into prescription of stimulants. And, um, and, and I suspect we, we've got a big scandal of, uh, about overprescribing of stimulants coming, coming down the line fairly soon. Seems to be a lot of, um, there seems to be a big increase in prescribing them to adults, not just to uh, children at the moment. Right. And that gets to the theory of the, the problem with the scientific validity of the diagnostic system. You know, I grew up on the DSM. And had, it came from the first version up to, I don't know, I guess I quit around four. I, what are we, five now? And, the, uh, and you have in Europe the ICD, a different diagnostic system. And, uh, and the book just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and people fight to get their, their particular malady in the DSM because then it becomes insurance billable. So one of the problems, I think, in social science is the replication error, uh, uh, the uh, problem that we're having trouble replicating are some of our seminal studies. But within psychiatry, we're having problems with the reliability validity of the diagnostic systems. I mean, when you come, have someone come in, are they narcissistic or borderline? I'm sure at some time you just want to flip a coin, <laughs> just 
just code them so I could get reimbursed, you know. Yes, uh, yes. This is the problem, isn't it? Because you need these codes for reimbursement, they've they've developed a life of their own. Right, um, right, you know, right. They, they which uh, and and they've 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 become entities in their own right, which they are not. So so I when I first trained the um, the the diagnostic manual that we used was the ICD nine. Right. And the ICD nine, what what it did is it had quite long descriptions of different syndromes um so long one for they have neurotic depression and psychotic depression and various sort of forms of psychosis um and, and so it was clearer i think with that that what this system was doing was describing patterns of behavior and patterns of experience and that is what the diagnostic systems are they are an attempt to classify very complicated personal experiences and i'm not saying there's no value in that classification i think that there can be but we need to recognize that it is it's very difficult and it inevitably involves a lot of simplification but most importantly it is not a diagnostic process we're not um, saying someone has a diagnosis of depression does not indicate that they have an abnormal serotonin system, as my research showed. It doesn't indicate that they have abnormal genes or anything else abnormal going on in their body. We Saying that someone is depressed is simply, giving them a diagnosis of depression is simply putting a label on what they have told you about their problems. And I think people fail to realise that. And understand psychiatric diagnosis as if it was the same as in medicine. Now in medicine, your diagnosis generally means we've uncovered the source of your symptoms. We have found that you have this tumor in the lung which is causing you to cough up blood and to cough and to lose weight. That's what diagnosis is in medicine. It is nothing like that process in mental health. It is a completely different process. And calling it diagnosis is very misleading in my view. But like you say, we've, we've, we've you know, got stuck with it because it's become part of this reimbursement system. And, and, and that's why you're on, that, that's why you're on the crosshairs of a lot of this attention from your article I believe is coming from people who are threatened by you rocking the boat a bit by saying let's let's just let's just back off here if this person's um, state and uh, depression and the fog that they're in is associated with uh, lack of work or uh, relationship problems or you know lack of exercise or too much alcohol or whatever maybe a good therapeutic relationship could have as as reasonable outcomes as walking into an um, to a doctor's office and having a 15 minute interview and getting a script but in, who in the long term undoubtedly much better outcomes probably right. for most but people who who wins who loses does johnson and johnson win when you know when we we take a, a more humane therapeutic approach no and uh, and that costs money and it means we have to have trained therapists and we have to have good supervision and that in the present system that we have in our country which is abominable is uh, we we don't we don't we don't have that it's just the opposite and so when you sound that alarm now i'm i'm seeing <laughs> It's it's kind of funny, but I'm sure it's not funny for you. I, I I'm seeing you being characterized as some kind of um, extremist, or you're you know a Scientologist. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it, it, it's comical that they're coming after you for these very reasonable attempts to say that we have a pill for that might not always be the best intervention for the malaise people are feeling. It seems to me that particularly in the US, it seems unthinkable for many people that depression, for example, is, should not, need not be thought of as a brain disease or a brain condition. So many people I 
have been talking to, so many journalists say, well, if it's not serotonin, what is it then? Is it another chemical? Is it, is it inflammation? Is it um, neurogenesis? And, and there's a certain amount of that, that thinking, but probably slightly less so in the United Kingdom as well. Uh, it, it, and, and I think that's where I am touching a nerve because there is a lot invested in viewing depression and other mental disorders as biomedical conditions, as conditions that originate in the brain or the body somewhere and therefore can be targeted and tweaked by modifying the body using a drug or ECT or something like that. I and think, uh, as you rightly say, there are an awful lot of interests now invested in that model, the psychiatric profession, um, the pharmaceutical industry, obviously medical device makers like ECT makers, but also I think now governments have, have got used to that, that way of thinking and it, it, solves, it solves some tricky problems for governments. It solves the problem of, well, you don't have to think too much about, you know, the fact that your society is driving people, driving people mad, making people unhappy. Uh, you can just carry on regardless and hope that the, uh, that the pills just, just blot it out for people. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point. It, it's it's it'd be a mistake, I think, to simply think that if we could contain the drug companies, um, everybody would agree with uh, uh, with with your view. Uh, I think it goes back to the ideology of individualism. I mean, really, in this country, and particularly in the states, uh, individualism is so deeply rooted that people can't imagine a solution that did not address the individual directly. A social solution. I, again, I was impressed as a younger graduate with Carl Rogers because he talked about people needing pals. You know, you need, I mean, he wasn't a Marxist, but I wasn't either at that time. But I just thought the idea that people needed someone to talk to is, is essential. And that's lost in this country. Essentially, it has to be treatable as an individual. Forget about other people. Sitting down and having a conversation with a friend about my emotional state when I'm depressed is a possible solution, but no one wants to countenance that. And that's why I think it goes deeper than just the pharmaceutical industry. We're really up against um, an ideological feature of capitalism that's, that's, that's very deep seated. I think that's such an interesting point. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's what I'm trying to say that actually these are not individual issues. They are social issues that, that need a social solution and a social approach. And that's and that's not just not just offering people you know an exercise bike or whatever it is or access to a gym. It it, it is you know fu fundamentally changing our social priorities uh, and and the nature of our social life to to ensure that that life is is better and easier and less stressful for the many more people than it is at the moment. You are wonderful. This is so nice talking to you. I've been, I have been devouring your work, your book, The Bitter Pill. I've read all of your articles and you are such a breath of fresh air and so lucid and ringing the alarm bell uh, that we need to just back off a bit and start thinking about these things as opposed to um, our, our, the way in which we tend to be approaching this with is just this, it's, it's a, we have a pill for that. Uh, that, you know, it's the individual's chemistry is the problem. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to maybe conclude with, I have a dear friend who is a, a teacher, extraordinary teacher, teaches advanced high school subjects. And I saw him at the store the other day and I said, how did, how was school? And he almost teared up. He just said, it's, it's just, my worst year yet, because the trauma that his kids have been experiencing with the pandemic, the isolation, the depression, he's never had so many cutters, there's no mental health services available, they, they, they people don't have insurance, and, and the idea that as a society that we would be approaching that as, well, maybe I can just get you on something that will make you feel a little bit better and send them out the door is, uh, that just sounds like a modern day horror story, a science fiction horror story. And that's, that's mm -hmm. what you are exposing mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm glad you are. And I, I hope you're getting support and continuing to do this. Thank you. Can I make one more point? Oh, yes. I, you, while you were talking. Yeah. So um, 
so I, I'm often accused of, you know, or, or people often say, well, you know, what about the people who have really serious depression or, or schizophrenia or something like that? Um, you know, surely you've got to do something. Uh, surely you've got to give them antidepressants or even ECT. Um, and, I, and I think, as I said, I don't necessarily disagree with using antidepressants all the time. I think we just need to acknowledge what they're doing. But, um, but I, think, I think we also need to accept that there are some cases that, that, that there are limits to our treatments. And there are some cases where the right thing to do is to look after people. And I think we have undervalued that um, and, and are not doing that well enough. Sometimes when people are really going through a bad time, the right thing to do is to look after them and keep them safe until they come out of it or until they come out of it enough that you can let, maybe start to help them through therapy or whatever to, to make sense of what's gone on. And you know, I think that looking after is a really important function in our society. It's something that, you know, that, 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 that different, different people have done more or less badly throughout history. They've looked after people who needed looking after. And I think it's something that, you know, in, in our modern day society, we, we should be working out how to do well and be valuing. Right. And, and in, in, we've had two people on our podcast. They were just wonderful guests. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, son, Mark Vonnegut, who's had uh, three psychiatric episodes beginning in this. He, he speaks freely of this beginning when he was in his youth and uh, initially diagnosed as a schizophrenia, but it was more likely a bipolar with psychotic features. And he talked about going off his medications and he, you know, would have a, he, you know, that he needs his medications. And Freddie DeBoer is the same thing, a prolific, wonderful soul. And he's written compassionately about how he has to take these medications that are harmful to him. They hurt him. They, they, they have these side effects, but he knows that he has them. So there, there's, a, there's a group of, I don't want people to get the idea that all medications are bad. There is a point where good, good medical intervention is imperative. It's life-saving. But for example, with Freddie DeBoer, he, he, he has trouble finding psychiatry. He has trouble finding treatment. He, um, you know, he, he, when he's in paranoid uh, uh, um, episodes, uh, the, the emergency room is his treatment facility. That's the worst place for a person to go yeah, for that yeah. kind of care. And um, it, it just, we're so cruel in our society and not being able to uh, deal with this in a better way. Uh, uh, and I, I hope we can. And your article certainly, and your work is exposing that, I think, as clearly as anything. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're wonderful. This has been one of my favorite podcasts. I probably shouldn't say, it's like having a child. You shouldn't say that's your favorite <laughs> child, but you're just, you're just, you're, you're really doing good work and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great. Really lovely. Um, uh, yes, keep in touch. Uh, Greg, what's your, how, how would I find your, um, um, on, on I have, we, we, have your, we, we, we have your email, right? That's yeah. how we re reached out to you. So I'll send you um, where I write and, and what I write. And I, and I'd, and I'd love to keep the conversation going yeah. because yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things I think that we could touch on even further. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'll send you that information uh, and, and, and we'll stay in touch. I yeah, really yeah, enjoyed yeah. your, your Marxist uh, article and, and I'll tell you more Thank about you. that when we communicate. <laughs> yes. Right. It, it got me to, I didn't know who Spinoza was, but I read a lot of Spinoza. Well, that's, he, that's, he's Levine. A, that's Levine. That's Levine. That's Levine. He's just yeah. wonderful. He's just wonderful. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Really okay. nice.